working with Flash, the first thing that will happen on the launch screen is we'll be creating a new ActionScript 3 document. You have other settings you can choose. We're not going to use a basic template. We'll be doing an ActionScript 3 document. Not 2, but 3. So just get in the habit of that. So if I click, it comes up. Now, when Flash comes up, I have a timeline down on the bottom. Each of these numbers here refer to a specific frame of my animation. Flash is a time-based media, so and it breaks the animation down into frames. On the right-hand side of the screen is my properties panel. To the right of that are my tools. The properties panel changes based on what is currently active. So if I click on the stage, if I click in the timeline, it changes to reflect what's there. So it's a contextual-based property window like in most of the Adobe products now. Flash does not give you the properties across the top like some of the uh, Photoshop and Illustrator have started doing. Uh, it still keeps it in its own panel on the side. Now, if I look at this, I'll see that I have under properties, currently I click on my main document area itself. This white area is referred to as the stage. The stage is where I can put my content. So if I grab something like my paintbrush, then I can put a nice happy face on the stage. And if I want to see my finished movie, then I can use the keyboard shortcut of Command Enter which is also, I can get to it by going under control, test movie, test, and we'll notice it has the keyboard shortcut next to it of command enter. Select that, here's my movie. It's not much going on yet because it's one frame long. So it just, in essence, is just repeating that frame over and over and over. Now, I have the paintbrush active, so now my property panel reflects the paintbrush. If I grab my selection tool and click on the stage area, I will see I have certain properties for it. I may decide that I don't like white as my background color for the stage, so I want my movie to be gray. So I click under stage and choose a new color, or green, or yellow, or, well, it's not really yellow. It's more kind of peachy. There's yellow. This particular background color is a solid color that I can choose. If I wanted to have a decorative background, a gradient background, or an image background, I would have to create that artwork or import that artwork into Flash and position it over the top of my stage. But I can't select anything except solid colors. And if I don't like the pre-built swatches, I can click and then choose something off of there and customize it exactly to what I want. Now when I test my movie, I will see that it looks like this. And I use the Command Enter keyboard shortcut for it. Now, if I look at this and put marks outside my stage and test my movie, I'll see that those marks exist outside my stage. So it's that area, the stage area, that is the, where your movie is. The default size here, 550 by 400, is the size that Flash was made back in the day when people had 800 by 600 pixel resolution monitors on their computers. This would pretty much fill the web browser window when you viewed the Flash content. Nowadays, people have ridiculously high resolution displays, and if you make your project the size, it looks tiny. You can make it whatever size you want, though I would discourage you from trying to make it HD video sized because um, what we've found is that just really is a lot of uh, memory for a flash to keep track of and it grows unhappy. Instead of worrying about the exact size, worry about the proportions. So if you want to make it widescreen, so if I wanted to do something like 720 by 400, I get more of a widescreen ratio. or I could make it 800 by 500 or you know, whatever size works for you. And then you can now have a nicer proportion shape. I'm not a big fan of the 3 to 4, the 550 to 400 kind of boxy letterbox shape. I like more of the widescreen view myself. So this is now the stage. I can change the stage color. I can change the stage size. 
If I want to use the rectangle tool, I can use that. I can grab that and I can draw myself a rectangle. Now, if I look at the shape that I've drawn, I will see I drew a rectangle over what was there. If I move that rectangle, I will also notice that it killed what was there. If I move it over here, it's effectively acting like a giant eraser. Because while you're working in Flash, it behaves like a single layered Photoshop document where the pixels are affected by the pixels, except that I can very easily select. So if I go here, draw that purple on top of the orange, and now, whoop, and now select by clicking on it and move it, I'll see that it effectively cut a hole in it. So it does some really weird things that if you're used to working in Photoshop and used to working in Illustrator, this is going to have characteristics of both as well as none. It has its own unique way of working. A lot of people find that when they grow accustomed to creating assets in Flash, they find that it's a fairly intuitive process, but it takes some getting used to because it's not making objects the way objects are made in Illustrator per se, except that, well, this is now, you know, look, it's, it's kind of like an object. I can select it, so it's not really pixels like I would have in Photoshop because it's not glued to the background. I can move it. But now if I move this over here, click off it, now it joined that shape up with the previous one. So it, it does some funky things that when you're not used to it, can be really frustrating and take a while to get used to. So I've created a bunch of crap on one layer here. And on the timeline, we'll see where it says layer one. Well, you can have as many layers as you want. Um, I'm sure there's a limit somewhere. I just don't know where that is. Just by the time you get up to a good hundred layers, you know, you probably have bigger issues that you're dealing with at that point and you'll need to address those. So in my layers palette on the left, I can just click the little page icon, the same icon I have in Photoshop or Illustrator for adding a new layer. It adds a new layer. And now on this layer, if I choose yet one more color and grab my paintbrush, I can see that now I can draw this shape and if I click on it and move it, we'll see that it's not affecting what's underneath because it's on its own layer. I can even turn off that layer. Now what's also kind of cool about this is that shape that I drew before, its edges are malleable. So it starts to behave like an illustrator based object or Bezier path that I've created. And for those who are Illustrator junkies, if you grab the white arrow here, the subselection arrow, and click on a path, you will see that it actually gets the points with the handles. So let me change the color here. Um, those points are easier to see. So it gets handles the same way it would in Illustrator. So if I'm used to working with other design programs, that knowledge is actually transferable here within reason. So I get the same handles that I have working with a shape or a path in Photoshop or Illustrator. So I have those path-based mechanics. I even can use the lasso tool the same way I would say in Photoshop to select something. It's highlighted. I can hit delete. It goes away. So it behaves a little bit like pixels, a little bit like paths, but it does its own weird funky stuff. So it's a program that once you grow accustomed to it, it makes a lot of sense on to why it does what it's doing. In the beginning, you're probably going to curse, scream, swear, call me bad names and other such stuff, and I'm used to it. It's okay. Yeah, my, my skin's thick, I can deal. I won't get personally offended. But now I can move that over. But it's also, it's kind of neat that you can have a shape and then if I want to cut a section out, instead of trying to create a complex thing, now that I've done that, I've now cut that portion out. I can move this over. And I don't really know what it is, but I was able to make it, so that's all that really matters. With Flash, CS 5.5, they introduced an auto recovery, auto save feature. 
So if you've worked in Word and some of these other programs where they'll auto save as you're working, so in case the computer crashes or you know whatever, some catastrophe, you don't lose all your work. Well, what we found is when you have a flash project that's a good you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 frames long, and it goes into auto save, the saving process can take like a minute. So you're in the middle of like painting the most perfect brush stroke on the most perfect shape character you've ever done in your life and suddenly halfway through that stroke it kicks into oh I'm auto saving your document and you see a spinning beach ball of death and you're like oh crap flash just crashed on me oh no what do I do what do I do ah and you start freaking out uh, so yeah I don't like that feature now we can modify the preferences in Flash by going under the Flash pull down menu and choosing preferences. And auto recovery is deselected. We've now done it to the whole lab because we ran into problems last semester, which was the first term we were using 5.5. And this auto recovery thing would kick in while they're working on their animation project. And their project's now you know, a couple thousand frames long and suddenly it's like taking five minutes to save and they're freaking out that the computer crashed. It's like, no, you want it to save when you want it to save. So the way to do that is to deselect auto recovery in your preferences. Now all these machines should be configured that way. But if you go into any other lab, I can't speak to their preferences. So you need to modify that. It's also important that when you create a new document, really one of the first things that you should do is, so I, I'm going to go create a new document. The first thing I should do is I should save it. And I should navigate to my flash drive or wherever I'm trying to save it and save it at that point. I'm going to save mine on the desktop right now because this is a demo file and I don't need to keep this. So I save it. Then make sure that is turned off. It seems that if that ever is turned on and you save your document, it forever wants to keep thinking that's what you intended, even though you deselect the box all the time, so it keeps wanting. It's like, auto recovery is not active. Do you want to make It's like, no, I don't want it active. Leave it off. So it's a feature to me that's not quite working right because it hangs up while you're working. The save process is too long, so I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, maybe if we were doing real short projects where the file size wouldn't hold up as bad, that would be that would work better. So now the tools here, you you can putz with them. I would just, you know expect that the way to get good at this is to play, to spend time playing the same way you do in every other program when you want to learn how to get good at using it. Now I'm using my um, Intos 4 Wacom tablet which means I can then click here to say use pressure so if I press lightly or press hard I get a different size mark. If you're not doing that you don't get to use pressure so it makes a mark at a consistent size and I choose the size brush that I want to do. When you're working with the tablet pressure is nice but even still if we notice this brush is making this size mark and now if I choose the smallest brush it makes that size mark. Now that's not a lot of variance but if I want to vary it what I have to do is I have to change my zoom. So if I zoom in now the small mark makes a line like this. Now if I choose the big brush the biggest line it can make is this. If I zoom in more so if you notice, the mark is always the same size on my screen. Fat, fat, fat. That was the fattest brush at three different zooms. If I want it to be even fatter, if I zoom out, it's the same thickness on my screen, but we can see it's much bigger in comparison to the document. So sometimes it may feel like when you're working in Flash that you don't have access to the full brush size of really, really small to really, really huge like you would in, say, Photoshop. Well, you combine brush size or pressure sensitivity with zooming in and out of your document. So now, if I, so if I want to, see, I can 
it's again same size mark but now it filled up most of my stage with a big fat line same brush I haven't changed my brush size I only changed the zoom this particular quirk in the beginning drove me nuts now I like it and I just get annoyed when I'm using brushes in Photoshop where they're like all over I find that I have more control of how my brushes work and operate here but I don't need those squiggles now making artwork is fine but what's more interesting is bringing it to life to bring it to life we're gonna animate a ball now if you remember back on day one I said I wanted you to do two drawings a week 20 minutes a week for you know the semester and that's for this moment right now because when I say make a ball you don't start going oh crap now I have to draw something it's like okay I can make a ball because I've you know done my 20 minutes a week of drawing no big deal so if I want to make a ball draw the ball the balls on frame one now if I want to add more frames to my movie what we are going to do is start out and do frame by frame animation like an old school flip book to do that I need to add an additional frame to my movie I am able to do that by choosing insert timeline blank keyframe. I'll explain what these different kinds of frames mean in a moment. Now if you notice next to frame it says F5. Keyframe happens to be F6. Blank keyframe happens to be F7. Why they don't say that on here anymore I don't know. It used to say you know 5, 6, 7 right there and it doesn't and it hasn't for a whole bunch of versions. So F7 is what we actually want to insert a blank keyframe. So F7 is the F key at the top row of my keyboard, the one with F7. Now some of the front row computers that have these slim keyboards, uh, the F keys don't always work quite right. So if it does weird stuff, then we'll deal with that in a moment. So if I hit F7, I get a blank keyframe, and it looks like this. So we can see original keyframe. It's gray, black dot indicates there's content there. My new blank keyframe is white, with an empty circle indicating there is no content on this frame yet. So if I want content, I can now draw on it. Let me just zoom back out. So I drew. Now, this red bar here is my playback head, and I can just grab that and move it, and we can see, ooh, look, I have two frames of animation. Now, if I play this particular animation at full speed, it's playing back 24 frames per second. It's kind of fast when I only have two pieces of artwork here. So it's going to look kind of seizure inducing flickering. Not really smooth animation yet. So what that's telling me is I'm probably moving too quickly from the first frame to the next frame. Or I need more frames in my animation. So I can hit F7 to get an additional frame and I can draw another circle. So now, now if we look at this, you're probably thinking, gee, it'd be easier to draw my next frame of animation if I could see the previous frame. And that particular technique in animation circles is called onion skinning. Traditional hand-drawn animation was drawn on translucent pieces of paper, like tracing paper, called onion skin paper. It looked like the layers of an onion where you can kind of see through it. So you can see your previous drawing. Well, Flash has that technique or that built in. Very bottom of this interface, you'll see that there's a tiny little box and it's called onion skin down near the bottom. And you click on that, it turns on onion skinning, and now I can move through my animation and it shows me my previous frames. So I now have three frames of animation. If I want a fourth frame, I can hit F7, and now I can draw. Now animation at its basic is change over time. So I'm adjusting the amount of change occurring over time. Where can you draw your F7? I'm doing a stroke and then I'm hitting F7. Doing a stroke and hitting F7.
And now if I turn off onion skinning, I can watch my animation play. And I can scrub it. Now I'm not even at one second yet. So this, this is going to fly across pretty quick. But you can see when there was less change happening, it slows down. So if I click on the stage, frame rate is a property of my document or the stage, and I can modify that number so I could modify it down to 12 and now play my movie and you can see it slows down. If I modify it down to 6, you can see it really... But notice that the animation looks jumpy. It almost looks like it's jumping from frame to frame, so it loses the fluidity, the smoothness of the animation once I go really below 12. So 12 would be the minimum you would want to do. Some of you may decide that in the interest of work that you'll animate at 12 frames per second just to keep from having to create that much artwork. And right now we're looking at using frame by frame animation, but we will look at using other techniques for animating your assets uh, the next time we get together. So what I would like for you to do is to now take this file that you've created this dot flaw file and I'm going to make a Dropbox in D2L for you to put it in to demonstrate that you were able to do frame by frame animation. Animation in its most basic simplest form. Now just to give you a kind of perspective if you go watch a feature length Disney animation which were 80 minutes in length on average that would be about 1.2 million drawings that make up that film just to give you some perspective when you start whining about the no you won't whine but you know you might grumble about how much work it seems to be for how little result animation is a thankless process that can be a lot of work it's also a lot of fun and we will look at ways to expedite the process so it doesn't completely overwhelm your existence